Welcome to the number one show and the source of truth for all things medtech. Here, we reveal the secrets and stories behind the investments, science, and commercialization of the medtech industry. Every week, we'll take you on a wild ride with the biggest names in the game, from entrepreneurs and investors who are shaking up the market, to healthcare providers who are revolutionizing the way we think and practice medicine. So hold on tight and get ready for a journey like no other. This is the State of MedTech. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Another ortho episode. We've really been racking it up with ortho episodes. We're going to be doing more in the neurovascular and urology space, among other specialties. But you know, we got a lot of love for ortho. That's really where we got our start. So this one, we got Dr. Paul Jacob. Uh, Dr. Jacob was recommended by Aaron Chester, who's VP of Sales over at ComMed, somebody who I have a lot of respect for and admire. And he said we got to have Dr. Jacob on. And so in this episode, we talk about implantables and wearables in the orthopedic space. Dr. Jacob published a great paper in the Joey uh, Journal, which you can see the f- uh, link below. And uh, don't forget, if you're a clinician listening to this episode, you can unlock a CME credit just by listening for free. So just click the show notes below. And if you're a med tech company looking to add CME credits to your webinars, your in-booth events, virtual demos, everything, uh, please shoot me a message or go to my website, katibandco.com and learn more. So Paul Jacob is a fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon who specializes in total reconstruction of the hip and knee joints. He's a native of Akron, Ohio, where he attended medical school at the Ohio University and then completed fellowship training at the world renowned Cleveland Clinic. And he serves both adult and geriatric patients now in the state of Oklahoma. Now, if you're interested, Dr. Jacob is also coming on my new series called Gloves Off. Great way to think about this is that Gloves Off is a live stream CME event that I do on the State of MedTech where we combine ESPN game day with YouTube product unboxing. So for Gloves Off, we're doing a total knee episode with Dr. Paul Jacob and the infamous Dr. Matt Barber. You guys know him from Ortho Real. He's a total joint surgeon with amazing ortho dad jokes on LinkedIn, but they're coming on the show to talk about their procedure tips and technology picks for Total Knee. That includes talking about the products they love to use, their approaches, and everything more. So you can register for that. They're going to be they're going to be doing that live with me at the end of the month. Um, so check the show notes below, or just go to the State of MedTech's LinkedIn page. You'll see the event there. And don't forget, if you're a clinician, that's a CME event, so you get a CME from that. Now, last thing I want to mention, a couple things. One is if you're a medtech startup looking to launch a new product, or perhaps you're a strategic, you're a large company that's already established and you're launching a new product, you know, data is really important. The best sales teams really have the best data. The problem with a lot of the data platforms today when it comes to looking up procedure volume and prescribing behaviors, uh, among many other things with your surgeons, is that those platforms cost a lot of money and they're a little bit clunky to use you know uh, if you're in marketing or you're in the data side like you know you you're able to you know use it but if you're a sales rep it's a real pain and so a lot of times sales teams don't like to use them that's why i partner with alpha sophia alpha sophia is focused on helping med tech companies discover early adopters using data to find based on procedure volume prescribing behavior and so many other data points who the best surgeons are for your sales team to target so you get a free report, not one, not two, but three free reports from Alpha Sophia because you're a listener of the show. Go to alphasophia.com forward slash Omar. That's A-L-P-H-A-S-O-P-H-I-A.com forward slash Omar. Submit your information and you'll be able to get a free report based on um, three surgeons or territories you're trying to look into and you're going to love their platform and here's the best part they have pure price transparency because even me at a startup i couldn't afford to use these larger platforms their user seats for using their platform starts at only 300 dollars a month that is it so imagine if you're a founder maybe a vp of sales or vp of marketing and you're trying to find early adopters use their platform because the other thing they've integrated is social media so you'll be able to look up physicians and see their Twitter handles, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And finally, that leads me to my last uh, little plug here before you get into the show. If you're a sales rep looking to level up your game, Look, we all know that physicians are on social media, but how do you sell using social media? How do you drive product awareness? Well, I started the Medical Sales Network Effects program to do just that 
since uh, the start of it last year, I've had hundreds of sales reps, VPs, CEOs, and more join the program. And now, just for the listeners of the show, I have a special uh, offer for my program. You can join it for literally half the cost. Just check the show notes below and click the link. In there, you're going to get not only the offer, but more importantly, you'll get all the content, which you can go through as many times as you want. You get into our private VIP group to network with other reps, VPs, and CEOs. Plus, we have live weekly coaching calls. And if that's not enough, here's what one rep had to say about the program. This rep is actually in the spine space. And these are the results that he got literally within a couple of weeks of joining the program. I tried to reach out to this one surgeon. I posted recently on LinkedIn about launching a bunch of new products in this year, in 2023. He accepted my connection request liked that comment and two days later booked a case with this new technology that we had showed him two days later or two days prior. So it was like all like a um, methodical step. So in the surgery yesterday went pretty well. He agreed to try it again. Um, so I think from our standpoint, it was a, it was a win, win, win of getting the connection on LinkedIn to seeing our content, having a good inner office meeting from a standpoint of being able to talk with the surgeon about the new technology and what his peer was doing and then having a successful case where he would want to use the product again. So if you're ready to level up, join the Medical Sales Network Effects program. And if you are a sales team and you're looking to buy a bunch of seats for your team, plus you want me to coach them, I love doing that as well. Just shoot me a message on LinkedIn or go to my website, kativenco.com. Now let's get on to our episode with Dr. Paul Jacobs. Enjoy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. We've got another great guest, uh, somebody who uh, comes as a recommendation from Aaron Chester, who's VP of Sales over at ConMed. Aaron uh, is somebody that has become a good friend of mine, somebody who I've T- profound, tremendous respect for. And he's like, you know, you got to have uh, Dr. Paul Jacob on. Um, and so, you know, Dr. Jacob, thank you so much for joining us today. And by the way, happy Labor Day. You thank know, you. Same to what, you. What's, what's, more, what's more American than, than working on Labor Day, right? Oh, that's the exact <laughs> thought I had when I signed up for this. I thought I'm doing Labor Day because that really sends a message for sure. Absolutely. But you know, it's funny. Um, there's a, 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 a a phys- clinician, uh, he's an um, interventional neurologist, I believe. Uh, if I, I got, if I mess that up, I'm going to feel so bad. He's in neuro, he's he's in uh, neuro. Uh, Mohammed Taleb, uh, who's really active on LinkedIn, and he's um, he's actually going to fly out for the show. And he was like, uh, he's like, oh well, I know you don't usually like to work on Friday, so I appreciate you doing this on Friday. I'm like, who said it's going to be work, man? I was like, this is the fun part of the <laughs> job. It's like I, I I have a business to bankroll this. <laughs> yeah. My wife often tells me that uh, any social event that we go to, I'm they call me Silent Sam. I don't have much to say unless somebody asks me something about joint replacement, and then you can't get me to shut up. So I can talk all day about this. <laughs> Man, I I love it. Before you know, before we get into it, I want you to, you know for the audience who's uh, learning about you, tell a little bit about your background. But you you gave me like the best compliment earlier. Can you tell the audience what you said about the show and specifically what you what you said about like uh, the sales episodes that 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 was yeah. great. Yeah, for for me, I I haven't been big into podcasting for a long time. I, I really started paying attention about a year ago, and I like everybody else started with uh, Joe Rogan. So listening to his podcast and that long format was really interesting to me. It keeps you thoroughly engaged, especially when it's a topic you're interested in. Well, I uh, I found your podcast through Aaron and I started listening to some of the episodes. And, you know, I, I of course, first went through all the uh, the ortho episodes and listened to all those guys. And some of them are, are friends of mine. And then um, I went back and started listening to the sales episodes. And I learned more uh, from the sales episodes than I think I did from the orthopedic episodes. And I was really surprised and shocked at how um, learning how those kind of guys think about selling to a surgeon and um, and how to approach uh, certain problems. And I've learned as much or more from those than I did from the orthopedic episodes. That's awesome. That's awesome. It makes, makes my it makes my day. And I think that's probably like one of the reasons why I started the, the, the show is just like, we work in a great industry. And I think it's it, it only makes it better the more we understand like how how this all how, how this whole thing works i mean it's it's yeah. a it's wild i mean you know compared to other industries if you think about it just like a simple implant or disposable making its way through procurement supply chain the decisions are made the people it touches and then finally makes its way to a patient you know um it's yeah, wild absolutely it's you wild. know one, one of the things that really for me hit home immediately was and i'm and i'm going to paraphrase this but i 
and I can't even remember who I exactly said it on one of the podcasts. Um, one of the sales guys said, if you're trying to get a surgeon to pay attention, you've got to sell them the problem, not the solution. That immediately was kind of gave me goosebumps. I thought that is what we're all trying to do is identify a problem and then create a solution to that problem. But you've got to make sure that the surgeon you're trying to sell that solution to has that same problem. So um, 100%. for me, all the, all the tech that we're getting exposed to today, it all comes down to, does it solve a problem for me and, and, and therefore my patients or, or does it not? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. You know, on that, on that note, maybe, you know, for the audience, get, like, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like who is yeah. Paul Jacob? So I, um, I'm a fellowship trained joint surgeon. I uh, started my career as a physical therapist and then I became a board certified orthopedic clinical specialist in PT and started my early career off at Kent State University in, in Kent, Ohio. Um, and I was able to get um, some academic exposure there and also run a clinic on campus and work with some of the athletes. And uh, a colleague of mine um, essentially bet me that I couldn't get into medical school. We were having a kind of an argument about whether it was harder to get into PT school or medical school. And um, and he said, uh, you know, I bet you can't, I bet you couldn't get in. And I, I took the MCAT, I think 12, 11 or 12 days later, uh, six or seven years out of undergraduate and somehow did good enough to get somebody to pay attention to me. And, uh, and so I went on to medical school at Ohio University and then uh, residency in Columbus, Ohio, and my fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic in adult reconstruction, hip and knee replacement. Cleveland Clinic is great, great for a lot of places, but uh, for a lot of specialties, obviously, but like for adult reconstruction, it was re it's, I mean, one of the best. I and mean, who were some of the mentors that you had when we were at Cleveland? Well, Will Barsoom uh, obviously was a, a incredibly influential guy. He's a, he's like the Pied Piper of orthopedics. You know, he could sell you anything. He could convince you of the value of anything. He's tremendously intelligent. And then Victor Krebs, uh, his the big kind of revision specialist there, um, and I learned um, more uh, both about being a surgeon inside and outside of the OR from Victor, and then. Um, Bob Malloy was a big, very influential person there. There were some young surgeons that were just a year or two ahead of me. Um, also, that um, Trevor Murray, um, Carlos Segura, and Mike Bloomfield—they were all a year or two ahead of me. So it was in, it was really a great opportunity to train with guys who were maybe one step ahead of you. Uh, you could kind of emulate and see where you're going to be a year from now, and and that that crew that core crew of guys was amazing. Probably my biggest mentor and a guy who still mentors me to this very day, a guy named Mark Forimson, um, past president of the American Academy of Hip and Knee Surgeons. And now Mark is, um, moved, he moved for a short time into uh, healthcare administration uh, and then went on to essentially do a lot of consulting work. And that's his big passion right now. And um, incredibly grounded individual. Uh, again, learned as much about how to be a good human outside of the OR as uh, be a good surgeon inside the OR and just learned a lot of life lessons from those guys. My, my fellowship in particular really changed the way I felt about surgical medicine from start to finish. If I had not done that, I promise you I would not be the, the person and the surgeon I am today. My residency was a lit, little bit more I wouldn't say malignant, but it was just a little bit more aggressive. And mm -hmm. when I got to fellowship, it was a real gentleman's fellowship. And, um, you know, they asked your opinion. They genuinely wanted to know what you had to say. They asked for input. I, I didn't know how to act for the first three months. I just was kind of terrified and silent. And, and they slowly kind of worked me out of my uh, shell and, and really turned me into the surgeon I am today. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I think... More and more people, you know, I talk to surgeons, it's, it's like that, which is just, your residency is just, they're just going to grind you into, into bone. But then fellowship is like, you know, very, very civilized, very nice, yeah. you know, very different. It was, uh, <laughs> it was, I didn't even, I would kept waiting for the other shoe to, to drop, you know, to, to get that screaming match going in the OR and it just never, never happened. And, uh, it was a totally different learning style for me. It was a different perspective on medicine. Uh, from start to, and that place is 
uh, you can't, you know, the Cleveland Clinic is just world class. And so just interacting with other medical specialties and surgeons there was it was a life changing experience for me. Oh, absolutely. And you know, it's funny you mentioned Will Barton. Will Barton actually was uh, on the show a long time ago. Um, well, it feels like a long time ago because we're, <laughs> we're, we're almost over 90 episodes, but um, it was about a year ago. But I got to have him back on. He has a yeah. fantastic like background as a, as a surgeon clinician and obviously like as, as a like executive leader now. He's over at yeah. Hopco, you know? Yep. So. And I'll tell you, if you put that guy in the OR today, he'd be as talented and as smooth as he was the, you know, the last time he was in the OR. And it's that, probably that's been a, a That's while. a big thing to say, by the way. That's a, cause like, yeah. uh, I, like, I don't know about you. So like for a lot of the audience, they, 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 I think they may know this, but like, you know, so my dad was a surgeon. I went off to medical school in Texas, but I ended up leaving halfway through. So I, I, I actually pay very close attention to like the types of people who go into specialty and everything. And it's usually very often that you meet somebody in hospital administration or an executive leadership who had, was trained as a surgeon. But we mm -hmm. talked to other surgeons that like, I wouldn't let that person open a can of tomato soup. The fact that you would say that about Will Barson, that's a, that's a, that's a big compliment. You know. Absolutely. He is as, uh, as talented a surgeon as he has a, a, a public presence and a public speaker. And I, I don't know many who I've seen get up in front of a crowd uh, and do it better than he does it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, he, he definitely has this amazing presence. Um, so, you know, just come, kind of coming back to, you know, so you right now your practice is very interesting. When you, you focus on adult reconstruction, you're, knee, knee, as they say, knees and hip, hip guy. Uh, we have an interesting practice. I know he's physician owned. Dean, tell us a little bit about the practice. Yeah. So and then we, and then we uh, got and then we got to talk tech. <laughs> yeah, I'm in a very unique practice environment. You know, essentially one that's it's a it's a dead model. You can't reproduce physician owned hospitals anymore because of the way the law is currently. Uh, and I'm I'm proud of Senator Langford here in in Oklahoma. He's kind of leading the charge to try and get back the ability for physicians to own hospitals. And I certainly love to support him in that effort. But, you know, we have three hospitals, we have a large multi-specialty uh, physician group. Um, and that's where my practice really came from. I joined a group of mainly sports medicine guys, didn't have a joints guy here, and they were certainly scoping knees and had been doing that for years. So when I walked in the door, I had a full clinic, I had a full surgery schedule from day one. Um, and they were excited about having a joints guy. And I was as excited about being busy right off the bat, you know, being a non-traditional medical student. I was, you know, in my twenties when I entered medical school, late twenties. Um, and so by the time you're I- like a, You're like a senior citizen in medical school. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so when I got out, I was like, I got to hustle. I got to be busy. I can't build a, a practice over 10 years. I got to build a practice over two years. So I think in my third year, I hit 700 primary joints and, um, and I That's thought amazing. I had met my peak, you know, and every year from that year to this year, I've grown in volume and gotten busier and busier. And how, how do you um, do that as a surgeon, by the way, like for, for, for surgeons starting out, like what's your best advice? Cause it's not like the good old days, like, you know, my dad was practicing where you just set up shop, you put your name outside of the office and you just kind of walk around introducing yourself to the referring physicians and you just sit back and let the referrals come in, you know, yeah, what, what would be your advice? I started on the other end of that. So as a physical therapist, I saw what's what, what busy surgeons did well. I saw what bad surgeons did poorly. And I took little notes um, about how, who, why were the busy guys busy? Why did patients seem to connect with those guys? Were they really better surgeons? Were they better um, PR guys? What, what, what was it about those surgeons? And I tried to grab little bits from everybody as I went into medical school. And then when I came out, I knew exactly the practice model that I wanted. I knew exactly where I was going to go. I heard you and Don Buford talking on the podcast. He, he said he was unique in that he knew he wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon even before very early on in his career. I knew I wanted to be not only an orthopedic surgeon, but I wanted to do joint replacement and I knew that before I ever even applied to medical school. Why? So, why is that? Like, what? What about joints? Do you do you love? Yeah, well, watching the patients actually get better. So yeah, so you know many what? surgeries. That's a good. You know, that's a good point because um, you know, so often medicine, you're tr you know, you try and get somebody back to a hundred. You can you never get them back to a hundred percent. Right. But you know what? Now that I think about it, joints is one of the few things where 
not only do you, does it happen, but you can you can see it happening. I think that's one of Absolutely. the big um um like uh rewarding things as a surgeon is that you can see and touch and feel what you're working on. Like being uh, my hat goes off to people in internal medicine. Like that's that's so Very hard. Difficult. You know, Very difficult. Yeah, because I mean, margin, mar, marginal incremental improvements, and it takes like a long time. And it's not mm-hmm. like you can just look at them and say, "Oh, you're doing better." It's like you got to run labs or you know get get panels or something. And our patients, we get more interaction postoperatively with our patients than I think a lot of surgical specialists do. And because of that, we, we get a lot of feedback, really positive feedback, generally grateful people. And that's really, I mean, I, that's what fuels me every single day is watching somebody who says, you absolutely changed my life. I thought I was going to have to retire, or I thought I wasn't going to be able to do this or that, or I thought my traveling days are over or Whatever it may be, watching those people uh, truly believe that not only are they have the possibility of getting that to uh, whatever activity they wanted back, but they can do it even to a higher level than they had ever possibly anticipated. So that's fantastic. That's fantastic. So you know, um, as since it is a state of med tech, we got to talk a little bit, a little bit about tech. Um, you know, recently, uh, and I have it pulled up here, actually, I was reading your, you had a publication in, in Joey, which is one of my favorite journals, big shout out to Ira Kirschenbaum, um, on the patient specific pain model for identifying patients at risk following uh, total knee arth- uh, arthroplasty. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that paper? I mean, what, yeah. what, 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 yeah. what brought about, brought it about? Well, I've been working with this particular product called Motion Sense, which is a wearable sensor that you wear around a, the knee both before and after surgery. Um, and we've been playing with this model for, gosh, maybe seven years now. Um, and when Stryker bought the company that had originally started designing that implant, I then um, came over with that uh, acquisition and we started building this um, data model. And just like many other devices these days, we're collecting all this data, but gosh, it doesn't seem to go anywhere. It doesn't seem to do anything. Collecting data for the sake of data. (laughs) It's data for data. And there was no way to impact the patient's lives that was currently giving you the data. You know, the best data is what you can use to affect the outcome on that particular individual patient. So patient reported outcome measures are or, you know, things like the Who's Junior and the Coos Junior and the Promise and all those um, outcome measures that we look at, they're looking at the one-year and two-year outcomes. That the, the die is cast for the patient that we're collecting that data from, and we're really hoping to improve things in the future. But the sensor and wearable data in particular allows us to make an impact on the patient's lives that we're currently collecting that data on. So I can start to identify things early on in their recovery that may be a red flag, that there may be an issue here that I need to pay closer attention to that patient. There are also things that tell me the patient's right on track, and I can kind of uh, put them on the back burner and not pay as close of attention. So the paper was really about using pain as one of those identifiers uh, and collecting that data over a large group of patients and then trying to figure out which low and high pain scores indicated a potential problem and using that uh, as a predictive model. So, you know, yes, it's eventually probably working toward an AI model, but really now it's about, you know, collecting that data using our current knowledge that we give the software platform to tell us when there's going to be an issue or there could be a potential issue. And we're identifying that after the first seven days of surgery. So we're collecting that data before surgery, we're collecting interoperative data, and then we're collecting postoperative data and using that to predict early um, patients who might have an infection, who might have a blood clot, who are at risk for developing those things because they're not being compliant or maybe their pain control isn't good enough for us to get them up and move. And so that's really what that paper was about, uh, our early model of predicting potential outcomes and intervening early. Got it. Yeah. And this is the part about medicine I really like. What I think is interesting, and I, I, there are some things I want to uh, uh, touch on with regarding the study is, um, but if you look at medicine in general, like one of the predictions that, I don't want to call it a prediction, but I was on, uh, you know, Alejandro Badia. Um, yeah. You should, I, I need to tell him, you should go on his show for sure. 
So he has this thing where you, when you come on, you got to come up with like three things that can really fix healthcare. And so one of the things I feel is that if you use automation and data capture the right way, you're able to capture data for the first time in medicine. So like back here, you know, I have uh, Schwartz's and Annals of Surgery. I have Harrison's internal medicine. There's certain, like the data you just described has never been caught in history. So the moment you get exposure to this data, you get exposure to a completely new way to treat a patient. And I think in order to predict injury pathologies and everything, you have to get the data, right? So do you Absolutely. feel like with these sensors that you can get to a point where you can essentially predict early indicators of complications, like let's say infections before they happen? Yeah, hundred percent. That's what we're driving towards. And we're already seeing that in our early predictive models. So we are, uh, I actually have a patient of mine who, uh, you know, I'll embarrass myself here. Uh, had She had an early infection. Well, we were able to capture that data and we could see it coming a mile away. We probably saw that um, two and a half weeks before she presented with symptoms. And mm. so we were all kind of wondering and watching and um, and then we started to see changes. It, I was getting alert after alert. I reached out to her and she said, well, I am, you know, I am having some issues. We brought her in. I took the post-op dressing down. Immediately, I was unhappy with the presentation and the wound. We took her to the OR based on the sensor data. Uh, prior to her having any manifestations of a paraprosthetic joint infection, took the took a bunch of cultures intraoperatively. They were all positive. She had no temperature. She had no change in ability to bear weight. All the things that we think of when we're paying attention to paraprosthetic joint infection, we didn't have to wait for those things to happen. We were seeing them with steps per day, exercise compliance, average pain scores. All those were outside of the the norm or the the data we expected to see for a patient in her demographic. And so we we were able to intervene. We took her to back to the OR, washed it out, changed the plastic. That's all the intervention we needed to do. And that for me was a absolute done deal. From that second on, I was like going downhill like a freight train out of control, trying to push for this technology to move faster and get better. Um, and, and I think that's my role in, on the team now is push harder, push faster. We've got to get this into the hands of our surgeons uh, who can really make an impact on everyday patients' lives. That's fantastic. Um, and I just made a few notes, but so correct me if I'm, if I'm off here. So you guys, since you had uh, with the model that you trained, it was about 3,500 pain schools, and then you validated it using another 1,000, correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. So one of the things that uh, you often see, especially, you know, pain is a subjective thing. We try to make it as objective as possible. It's a very subjective thing. The problem with a lot of studies when it comes to pain is that you have a lot of variability, right? And, and very broad variability. You guys essentially adjusted for that, it seems, correct? And you used yeah. like individual pain patient scores. Uh, how how yeah. did you How did you do that? Like I, well, I, that when I saw that, I was like, wow. I mean, that's not easy, you know, but part of the problem is when we collect, it, it, it can even be influenced by who's collecting the pain score. So if I ask a patient, hey, what's your pain today? They often will tell me a lower pain score than they're actually at because they want me to be happy with how they're doing postoperatively. They want to to show Cognitive engagement. Cognitive biases are alive yeah. and well still. <laughs> right. So if you're on a cell phone at home with nobody sitting around, you're much more likely to be honest. Um, and I, I think that that has made a difference in the usability of the pain score. Because, um, you know, like you said, very subjective. But what we were able to do is even take patients who the average pain score is higher and norm normatize that data so that their variability still would fit within the parameters that we set and wouldn't be alerting me. So if you say a seven out of 10, every time you rate your pain, but you go up one or two, even if you go to a nine, it may not alert me because you're well within that standard deviation of normal versus a patient who's normally rating their pain at a two or a three and goes to a 10. Um, and so we took the length of time they're rating their pain scores high, how high they're rating their pain scores, and then what's their average pain rating. And that helped to predict when the high pain scores were actually important or when they were when, when the surgeon needed to pay attention. So, you know, one of the problems with a wearable device is, uh, is alert fatigue 
right? So as the surgeon, if you get alerted about all kinds of stupid things multiple times a day, you just start swiping those alerts away. You stop paying attention to them. We really want this device to be very specific when it alerts you about this being uh, something you need to pay attention to. Uh, So instead of giving you data on all kinds of things, so the sensor is amazing. It can give us data upon data upon data. We really tried to to shrink it down to four or five things that every surgeon's used to paying attention to, and then take that data and really alert the surgeon only when there is an absolute need to have some sort of intervention in the patient's care. Um, and, and that's what that spread or that, that data analysis enabled us to do with all those you know, thousands of pain ratings over a 90-day period. Got it. And the and the, the device is, is motion sense, which Stryker has now acquired, correct? Mm-hmm. That that's correct. Every time I actually uh do a search for a wearable sensor around a knee, it seems like there's a new company producing something. Um it's really exciting for me to watch this particular market grow. The challenge is it's collecting data and presenting it to us in ways that we've never had to use. Um, so surgeons are used to looking at range of motion with a therapist potentially pushing on that leg and measuring it with a goniometer. Now we're looking at the average, um, you know, patient range of motion as they function through the day. Those numbers are different. And so we've got to give a uh, normal value and then identify outliers to be able to tell our surgeons when is it important to know that your average daily range of motion is below a certain amount. Um, and so we've we've worked hard on those predictive models and and number one we we figured you know we made sure the device was accurate number two we collected the normative data over a large group of people and then third we started to identify when do we need to pay attention when is it identifying a problem and that's where we're at right now and you know with this with this kind of device the idea is this is monitoring somebody who has uh, knee pain, right? And to get to a point to try and uh, get them get them to surgery if they need it earlier sure. is that is that the purpose? Which is which well, is smart, by the way, on Stryker's end because I think I mean if you if you think about it, it's it's identifying patients to get them into surgery. So you, so you have so essentially the surgery is like less. I don't want to say less invasive, but you know versus somebody who's going to be going on for a while and you have all kinds of uh, pathological da- pathological damage over time. So this is the, the idea is to identify it earlier, intervene earlier. Is that correct? Yeah. And also, how do we identify problems before anybody knows there's a problem? You know, so post-operatively, we're, we're collecting, again, we're, we got back to this whole thing of all this data is coming in and things that we think are important as surgeons because we've been trained that way. You know, orthopedics is full of anecdotal data. You know, what, how do you know that? Well, that's the, what the guy taught me ahead of me, who's a world's leading expert in this field. We don't know. Things like BMI is a great example. Is BMI a predictor of poor outcomes? Is there really a higher complication rate? Well, there's papers that say absolutely yes, and there's papers that say absolutely no. I think sensors are going to be a really good way to identify, um, you know, and solve questions like that. Is BMI really impactful in uh, short-term, mid-term, and long-term outcome. And I think that we're going to see some data points that we thought were really important aren't that very important or aren't that very predictive. And some some of the things that we never thought we needed to pay attention to, like gait analysis before and after surgery as a predictor of a potential early poor outcome, those things, we, we've never been able to collect that data. So it's never been meaningful. It's never been looked at. It's never been published on. And those are the things that are going to start happening. Um, guys are really, guys much smarter than me are already figuring out ways to grab that data and use it to their patient's advantage in ways that the the sensor isn't really even designed to, to identify. And it's already happened. That's amazing. You know, the one thing I did notice with the study is that it didn't, I mean, like most studies, it's not something that's going to be like the end all be all conclusive. You should use sensors or not. And so it wasn't able to fully confirm that, um, that pain score alerts are always going to indicate like clinically relevant, uh, uh, signals. Right. So if you, if you run this, this, this study again, or if you do future studies like this, what kind of things would you change? Would you change the patient population and anything? I mean, 
I would imagine you're going to try and replicate the study in, in the future. What, yeah. what, what would you change or what would you do we, differently? We need more surgeons involved in it. So we need it to be a multi-center study and we need to collect massive amounts of data because, you know, if the in post-op infection rates between one and 2%, think about how many of those we have to capture before we can identify, point. you know, well, the numbers. <laughs> and I was going to say, the other thing is like, um, because this, this is a problem in medicine is that like a lot of times when it comes to fixing a problem, not everybody's going to be down to just be like, yeah, I'll enroll study and let you, let you know when I screw up. <laughs> That's right. You have to be totally transparent. And, you know, the, the first thing that I um, noticed with the sensors was in my head, every one of my patients is off pain medication two weeks post-op. Every one of my patients hit 130 flexion within two or three weeks because, I you know, I, I, I think I'm pretty good at what I do. Well, the data really opened my eyes to where people really are at, what their range of motion actually is, what their daily function is, how compliant they were with their daily exercise versus how compliant I assumed they were being. Mm. You know, one of the things that I've really noticed, I intervene on much more than I ever thought I would is getting the patients who are doing too much to stop doing too much. Interesting. You know, we see patients who are taking six or 7,000 steps a day, 10 days into their recovery, and then they can't figure out why they can't get their swelling under control and why their foot and ankle is as big as a house at the end of the day. And just telling them, hey, let's try and limit it to around 2,000 steps over the next couple of days. And let's just do the exercise as prescribed instead of five times a day, let's do it the once or twice a day that it's prescribed for. And just making those simple changes not only does it help the patient to know that I'm fully engaged in this recovery process. And just because the last suture went through skin doesn't mean that I'm done. So that is really impactful to the patient. But number two, it's opening my eyes to what's really going on after the patient leaves my hospital. You know, what, what potential problems that I could immediately intervene on are being um, identified by the sensor. It, it's pretty shocking what I'm starting to pay attention to. Yeah, you know, I got to say, like, um, I think at least as it pertains to medicine, and you can even call it uh, uh, population health to some extent, you know, the last like five years between the biohack movement and the wearable, you know, wearables finally starting to like come out of their hype cycle. I think their hype cycle was like 2015. Everybody was like, oh, wearables. And we all Absolutely. realized that you buy a Fitbit it ends up in the drawer for like, like two months later. You know, for me, yeah. I wear I wear a Whoop device. And I think the fascinating thing about data is um, it's, its ability to change behavior, I think is the biggest thing, right? Yeah, um, I like, absolutely agree you know, Do you think like, I mean, so for, for Whoop, for those who don't know, Whoop is a, a fitness wearable. And so for the way it affected me is... Um, I got really big into measuring my heart rate variability. I noticed that every weekend I love, I live in SoCal. So I love like, you know, uh, you know, double IPAs and everything. So every weekend I, you know, I'd have like one or two beers, no big deal. Mm -hmm. But I noticed it would just tank my HRV. It would kill my sleep. Just a, a drop of alcohol. I mean, cardiologist knows them. all the yeah. all the guys who are card card uh, cardiology guys. They message me. They're like, yeah, man, like we've known this for a long time. I'm like, well, you guys did a bad job marketing it. Um, do you feel like in the future, there might be some consumer wearable tech specifically for joints, like for people who don't have pathologies even. Um, what would that look yeah. like? You know, it's interesting, you know, you're talking about modifying behavior. That's one of the things that we started to notice was um, patients can see benchmark data and they can see where they sit inside of that benchmark data. So they have, they, they have access to the motion sense data. Yeah. So oh, they can see this window and they can see at their interval in time based on their gender, their age, and some other demographics, where should they be and where are they? Um, and so it sparked not only this reassurance that I'm, yes, I'm where I'm supposed to be, which is a big battle uh, for me in the office is everybody comes back thinking they're way behind. And if you talk to anybody who's a year or more out, they're going to tell you a story that's not true. You know, I didn't take any pain medication. I hit my range of motion marks two weeks before I was supposed to, they don't remember the events the way they actually occurred. And that's a protective mechanism, you know, that our brain has in place. But what I started to notice was that that question happened less. They could already see they were where they were supposed to be. And then it sparked a competitiveness inside of people. Well, I know I'm here, but I want to be here. 
I want to be above where I'm supposed to be. And so it has pushed them uh, to monitor their own recovery uh, and be engaged in their own recovery and pay attention to their outcome measures in a, in a way that was very strange. I have a guy who's been wearing the sensor for seven months. He, we, we target 90 days. He will not give them back. He loves them. And he is absolutely wears them every day. He can't, is his insurance still covering that or how does that work? We, you know, the, the, it, by law, we could be billing him every 30 days, as long as we collect 16 days worth of data in that 30 day period. We, we don't, but, um, it's, it's interesting. We could be, um, but I mean, it, you know, if you think about like value-based medicine, I mean, this is a great example of it. It's like, you could be billing him, but you're technically keeping him out of returning yeah. back into the clinic. Right. So like, Without I don't question. know, uh, there, there's, is, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, this is really interesting. This is a, um, something that we, we're being forced as joint surgeons right now. We, we can't even keep patients overnight in the hospital anymore. And we're pushing ourselves as a profession to get better and get patients home faster. But there is an element of responsibility that we have as surgeons to appropriately monitor these patients. And when they leave the hospital, that gets infinitely harder. And it puts a huge demand on my staff. Well, this is a way to bridge that, to eliminate that increased demand, to have appropriate monitoring of my patient, their recovery and their outcome, and have them feel confident and comfortable that, man, Dr. Jacob's on it. He's watching me. He knows what's going on. He's paying attention and he's getting alerts about things that maybe are outside of the normal. It's very reassuring for patients. That's fantastic. I was going to ask, you know, like something that's unique about your background is that you're in, you're a physical therapist before you became a surgeon, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and for me, I mean, we keep hearing uh, like <laughs> value-based care. I feel like it's kind of like value-based care to medicine is kind of like what AI is to like tech. You know, it's right. just like everybody talks about it, but like very few people actually do it. Right. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are because, you know, if you look at healthcare in the United States in the last like decade or two, um, a lot of consolidation happening. It's hard to, you know, like physician owned practices, physician owned hospitals are hard. Um, and you're seeing like a lot of private equity move into orthopedics mm -hmm. and again, consolidation happening there. I'm wondering what you're, how do you feel about, um, sort of a full continuum of care within orthopedics where the physical therapist, the orthopedic surgeon, anything that has to do with, you know, uh, joints and stuff. Do you feel like that should all be consolidated? Well, I, I'm in a, what's called a CJR market. So there are- What is that, CJR? Yeah. So Medicare has a pilot program. I don't know that it's so much of a pilot anymore. Where I think we're in the seventh year now of this, this forced bundled payment program. But essentially what happens is they give you X amount for the episode of care. So the 90-day episode. So anything that occurs in that 90-day episode- from three days prior to surgery to their 90 day, that comes out of that bundled payment. So if they go to the emergency room, we burn that bundle with a single visit. You know, the therapy, the, the you know, the accoutrement around surgery. So what ice machines and all those things does the patient get? All that is incorporated in that bundle. And if you're not engaged, and what it really, really did was force surgeons to be engaged in the cost saving side of things, but they, you can also be incentivized by your hospital with a gain share contract. So they can share a percentage of whatever they get at the end of the year if they save money or they stay within that, that uh, bundled payment. Uh, and so it, it started to force surgeons to, instead of, in the past, it's always been, well, the surgeon and the rep are together as a team wanting whatever new technology was available. And then the hospital was on the other side of the fence and the rep could kind of use the, the surgeon against the hospital saying, Hey, I'm just coming here because my surgeon wants this. I'm, I'm representing him and you could pit them against each other. Well, that can't, it doesn't happen as much anymore because I'm as invested in good, saving good old days. as anybody else. So <laughs> Man, I'll tell you and here, actually, I got to, I got to bring it over because I, the reps are following me. Actually, I need, I should probably finish it this week because I told them all I'd, I'd do a review on this. So there's a book that's no longer published. Probably costs like, it's like a hundred, 200 bucks to get, even if you find out anybody called, um, have you heard of this? The salesman surgeon? No, this, this is a hell of a book. This blew the lid off of the, re uh, medical device world. Um, it was written back in the seventies. Let me see. It was written wow. in 19. 
1978, essentially this uh, distributor up in New York pretty much wrote this book documenting the fact that, yeah, you know, when I go sell like um, implants for knees and hips and everything, um, I'm actually the one doing the case. Cause like there was a part, there's a part, like a pivotal part in the book where he had this new implant. The surgeon was like frustrated. He's like, he's like, you know, screw you. He's like, well, you know what? If you think this is so easy, you put in. So the surgeon like walks out and they all looked at him and he's like, all right, I'll scrub in. And then from then on, anytime the hospital was going to use this guy's device or implants, they're like, you got to scrub it and do that part of the surgery because it's so complicated. Like the surgeon's like, I don't want to learn it. And so he did this for a long time until I think like um, the hospital got sued and they're like, well, why are we getting sued? Like this guy was doing it, you know? And so he wrote this wow. whole book about it. Yeah, man, it, it, this is wild times. It wasn't that Could long. Could you imagine? Like 1978. So, yeah. so this book was written in 1978. That stuff probably continued well into the 80s. <laughs> you can't barely get into our hospital without, like, you almost have to give a DNA sample. And you, I mean, you name oh my it, God. they have tracks no. and all that stuff. It's crazy. Look, I, look I'm, I'm not that old. I remember a day when I was like 13 years old, I just roll up into the hospital. I would walk back to the OR and be like, hey, I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Khatib's son. Um, I'm going to go watch him. And they're like, yeah, sure. Just, I'm like, can I just, I just go in the locker and they're like, yeah, just borrow some scrubs in there. Just pop back in. What's going on, everybody? I'm just going to hang yeah. out. <laughs> you know? I mean, you couldn't wild even. Wild times. You, you might not even be able to get through the front doors of our hospital in, no. in that scenario anymore. You oh, know? man. You, you, like, and I was going to say, like, you, you're in a physician-owned hospital. Can you imagine what it's like, um, like one of these, some of these larger, like when I try and go to Hopkins or UCSF, it's like Fort Knox. Oh, I know. It is insane. I I can't, you know, I train, I do a lot of of, of training for robotic surgery and we can't even do like a a Zoom call without going through the medical education department and getting approved to present to a surgeon in their hospital. Um, It doesn't have to be CME related or anything. Just if we're going to talk to a surgeon about a technology, um, we have to go through the med ed department to get clearance in, in many hospital systems now. See, you, I'm, I wasn't expecting this to come up, but like you, you just proved a great point that I've been trying to make this industry for like a long, long time. They're starting to listen now, I guess, which is, you know, if we have all these limitations, this is where I think using new digital channels to educate and engage physicians, like, you know, not, not boring zoom webinars, but like engaging live streams, you know, podcasting. Yeah. Joey's like an awesome one. I love the Joey journal. Yeah. I like I was telling Ira, I hope um, cause I'm trying to tell other specialties about it. I want to see a Joey in like other specialties. Like can it's you imagine the time for it, you know, journal of nature and all these really, you know, they've gotten out of control with charging people to publish. It's nuts. And then making- you have to pay for your own own publication to get a copy of it that they're making money off of. They're making a ton, not just some money, they're making a ton of money. We're being ultimately exploited. uh, And if we don't get a hold of this quickly, it will spiral out of control. Oh, and Ira, you know, Ira hit just at the right time. His model is so unique and so needed right now. It's just a, Every submission that I um, send in is all going to Joey without question. If he says no, then I work on other journals, but he he has earned my submission for every paper I write. Yeah. And by the way, uh, for those who are, who are listening, I'm going to drop the link in the comments so you can go check it out. But um, uh, Dr. Jacobs Publication, if you look it up, you can go to joey.pub, J-O-E-I.pub if you're driving so you don't click the link patient-specific pain model for identifying patients at risk following TKA. You can just look up TKA and pain scores. It'll come up, download it. You can see the number of views and PDFs. And for those who are from, not familiar with Joey, it's a free journal. Everything, every, all of it's free. All of it is free. Um, and personally, I mean, I, I tell industry, I'm like, you know, you guys are dropping money on a ten, fifteen thousand dollars on like a bus wrap at a conference. Why don't you go spend some money with Joey? It'll be much better. <laughs> money better well spent. You're supporting the med ed community. You Without know. question, you you had mentioned something earlier, and I know you've had, um, you know, the executive team from Avail on. Um, yeah, Dan use, Dan Hawkins. Yeah, we we use Avail in our OR, and one of the things we learned during COVID was I can actually train a surgeon how to do what I do better during a virtual surgical observation than I can with them standing in my OR where they're staring essentially at my back 
for the yeah. majority of the procedure. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a camera right over the field. We have a camera in the light. I have, I have a camera I wear and they can switch between all those views. They can see the robotic screen. They can constantly see the patient's x-rays all um, flipping through it at their convenience. Avail has made it so easy to train surgeons from anywhere in the world. They can um, log on and be in my OR and talk to me just like we're talking right now during the surgery, like they were standing right over my shoulder. It's a tremendous, um, that, that field is really blowing up and it, the Avail has been amazing to work with. A hundred percent. And, you know, on the, on the clinical support side, you know, cause you know, when I was a rep, I mean, just covering territories was so, so difficult. So the thing I love about avail is that it scales your best clinical people to be in the OR at all times. Yeah. Um, my hat, you know, Dan, Daniel Hawkins has become a good friend of mine, the, the founder of avail. Mm -hmm. Um, he's actually, he and I are going to be on stage at Dreamforce at, in the NASDAQ center for Clary. Clary is one of my sponsors, an awesome software yeah. company. Um, but my hat goes off to him like that guy, he could not be anything else but an, uh, an entrepreneur. Like, I mean, he, he found a shockwave, they were public, and then he just saw this huge issue with clinical support and said, yeah, this rocket ship that I'm already on, like I could just be chilling here coasting. I'm going to go yeah. start another company to solve this problem. So like big hats off to Dan Hawkins. Yeah, hats you know? off and thank you because it has, it was, I don't know what we would have done in COVID had we not had that opportunity to continue oh, to train totally. surgeons. It was the only, it was our only vehicle to do it a hundred percent grown and grown. I think it's an, ex it's such an exciting time to be a surgeon because you got, you got a veil where you can go and just hop in anytime you want to watch mm -hmm. live surgeries, not just as a surgeon, but like, like when I was head of marketing to go, like you have to go and spend time in these ORs to go and send like our R and B team or like an engineer or product person to an OR was a royal pain. And this is pre pandemic. Like now, forget about it, but you have that, awesome. you have Joey publications. And then with that, I saw you, you, post a lot on LinkedIn with the advent of LinkedIn. I mean, you can post a case and within 24 hours, I mean, Moby Parsons does this a lot. Within yeah. 24 hours, you get um, feedback from some of the top names in the world in surgery, just, just to give you feedback on your case and you get better the next day as a surgeon. Like what a time to be alive. LinkedIn's a, a really unique, uh, it was something I never used. I had, I had in its early days, it was really it sucked. Well, I'm going to say it was right bad. Now. I mean, I've been I've been bad. a user for a long time. It was I I started writing uh, articles on LinkedIn back in 2014, 2015. It was real bad back then. It was bad. It was bad, and I, I think the, the you know I'm somebody tags you in a post and they've got a case. They you know you always I probably you there's ten or twelve responses every time somebody does that where I'm learning, I'm learning something, I'm picking something up. Somebody's showing a device they use to get an implant out that I've never been exposed to before. I mean, I, I probably learn as much from my colleagues on LinkedIn as I would from a professional colleague in a fellowship. It's pretty- Oh, a hundred percent. You know, uh, it used to be, so a few years ago, like Twitter, Met Twitter was really popping, especially during the pandemic. The problem with Twitter, as much as I love it, I, I still, I use a platform a lot they have an issue with fake accounts and trolling. And so as a clinician, you know, you're trying to have like an academic discussion and then you have like just nonsense. Right. Right. What's nice about LinkedIn is that it's an open platform like Twitter, except that everybody has their real profile mm -hmm. and every, everybody knows that if you comment, like every, your whole network gets alerted. So there's, there's, there's kind of this invisible rules of engagement that makes it a lot easier. And I'll tell you like, um, Aside from learning, some of the I think Ortho LinkedIn, thanks to thanks to Ira and Joey, is probably the most active of all the, the LinkedIn communities, medical communities. But some of the debates and comments I see in Ortho LinkedIn are just hilarious. They're just oh yeah. Insane. There's a there's a guy maybe you know who it is. He's either Rush. I, I hope I don't offend Boris. Him. Is it Boris? Yeah. Oh my yeah. god. No holds yeah. bar. What's his yeah. name? Boris, right? Yeah, and yeah. he's I'm, no I'm holds giving bar. him a new nickname. No holds barred. No holds barred, yeah. Boris, because he does not yeah. hold back. Here, here in the states, Sean Palmer is a guy who's who's coming at you guns a blazing. That's the Just other one. Yeah, him. yeah. He'll he'll get you no matter what you post. And I love I love that about Sean because he, he every one of us posts something, and then we're all sitting there thinking. Uh, what's Sean going to post on this? And, you know, I, I love hearing his unique perspective on it. Um, and he is a voice of reason 
in a time when we have so much technology at our fingertips, right? What's really adding value? Um, what's really worth the cost to our patients? He brings that voice every single time and he'll bury you. Uh, he, he's, he's well thought out. Um, he has good defense for the statements that he makes and he's ready to argue with you if you want to start a conversation. And I think that's the way it should be. And I like it out in the open. I mean, uh, another speaking of which about, I think, again, there's this um, traditional medicine was kind of like, you can have some debates like clinically, like at the hospital or in the, in the, in the, in the uh, lecture hall. And then you go to the conferences and you present, but on rare occasions, is anybody going to go up and in the Q and a section, yeah. call you out? That just does not happen. Right. Even, even amongst like, I, I think like, I'd say like CT and orthopedic surgeons are probably the most combative if I had to right. pick, but even among them, they don't. But now with this new format, like I think it's totally okay to do it. It only lives for so long. Yeah. The other one, um, are you going to be going to ortho summit uh, in yeah. September? I'm trying. We're, we're trying heavily. My practice have is you, pretty have you busy. Been so I've never been. This is my first year that I was invited. So I, I really, I, I really want to go there, but I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it out. But, you know, Kevin Plancher came on to show you the founder of Ortho Summit. And, and I, their heard, whole I, thing, I listened to the. Oh, you podcast. listened to that one? It was great. Yeah. Was yeah. Their, their whole thing was, um, which I like is, it, you know, they encourage debate. But then if you're going to debate, you got to know the other person's argument just as well. And I yeah. was like, that, you know, so it's teaching people how to think, you know. You know, it's, it's uh, essentially, uh, if you've ever been to a m and conference or a mortality and morbidity conference, it's those are closed door, they're private, and you Very. present complications and other surgeons critique your handling of those complications. It's, uh, we need, we absolutely need to be held accountable professionally, but we also need a vehicle where we can stand up in front of our colleagues and say, you know, here was, I did something, here was the outcome, we had a complication, I need to get better so this never happens again. Uh, and we need a way to do that professionally without being ridiculed. Um, and, you know, today we're just, social media is so present in everybody's lives that we're all afraid somebody's going to post something or say something and it's going to be out there and we're going to, you know, have to deal with it forever. And um, LinkedIn is, you know, people will call you out and they'll tell you when they think you're wrong, but it's, a, it's still very professionally done. Uh, mm -hmm. Very similar in its uh, the, in a uh, to a mortality and morbidity conference. Yeah, and I, I think what's exciting is just see how how this all evolves. Um, you know, I think with the advent of like podcasting, you know, uh, content on LinkedIn, everything it's kind of like the second Gutenberg revolution if you think about it. Because think about it as like um, you know a really. Th a, We'll take my dad, for example, busy surgeon, um, ran his own private practice. And so in between his, so like on, if my dad was practicing today on his way to and from work, he could listen to a podcast and learn about a new procedure, new technique, new way of dealing with patients. Then at, you know, at, and at the hospital, you know, in between cases, he'll have like an hour or two downtime. Maybe he doesn't have any uh, notes to do. He can hop on LinkedIn, post a case, you know, see what people have to say about it literally learn in real time and then change his workflow the next day. That's you know, insane. Think about, think about the, the, the guy that I always think about, and there's one particular that comes to mind, a guy that goes by trailer park ortho, uh, on, on his X or, or Twitter account, but I got to look this guy up. He's, he's great. And he's in rural, in a rural community has, doesn't have colleagues that, um, he can bounce things off of and he'll, he'll use us, as his professional colleagues to trailer you know, park orthopod. Yeah. That's yeah. Him. I'm going to follow him. Yeah. He's great. Yeah, he's a great he's, example. Cause not yeah. everybody's working at mass general. You know? yeah, right. Yeah. And I, you know, I, when I first came to my group uh, being obviously a very junior surgeon, I didn't have anybody that I could go to and say, Hey, what are you doing this? And I'm taking out a distal femoral replacement that's been infected. What, how are you doing that? And my sports colleagues were like, uh, good luck. You know, I, I, I don't have much input for you. And so I, I felt a little bit on an island. I also think that was incredibly valuable to me. I didn't have somebody telling me, this is the way we do things here. This is the way you're going to do things. Or this is the implant we use here. That's the implant you're going to be using. Um, it allowed for some innovation and some out-of-the-box thinking uh, that I 
I could not, um, you know, put a value on. Yeah, no. And I think, I think that's probably the, the best part is just like how, how people's, and no, I don't know if anybody's documenting this, but I would love to see somebody do almost a retrospective on their own practice and say like, this is how, like what I used to do a year or two ago. And this is how things have changed as a result of like these online communities. Um, I want to kind of like, uh, swing back over to tech, you know, outside of the wearables, you know, you, you know, you, you, you do use robotics. I'm wondering, um, right now, I mean, feel free to plug. Uh, I'm, I'm totally okay with that on the show, but are, are there any technologies that you're particularly excited about that you just started using, you know, and how did you find out about those technologies? Yeah. You know, for me, it's mostly, I do a lot of revision work, uh, on top of my, I do about 1,200 primary hip and knees a year, and then I do revision cases on top of that. For me, a lot of the innovation that I'm looking for is not in primary hip and knee replacement. It's really in revision technology. So the first thing that I ask myself, um, and this is a Victor Krebs-ism, if you would uh, allow, um, the first thing that I really ask myself is, if I'm putting this implant in, how do I get it out? And maybe that's a strange way of thinking about things, but with every implant that I choose to use, I have a plan for how I'm going to get that implant out if the stuff really hits the fan. And so that's how I initially evaluate all technology is what impact is it going to have? Is it going to make my life harder if I have to take this implant out or is it going to make it easier? Uh, And so a lot of what I'm looking at right now is um, things like, um, for, for instance, there's a, a femoral stem extraction system made by a company called Watson. Um, And it has absolutely completely and totally changed the way I think about removing or revision hip uh, replacement in particular. It's a very high risk, difficult case. Um, And it has really become a very controlled, straightforward, easy and simple thing to do. And just with the advent of that one bit of of, uh, technology and that one device, Hmm. It seems so simple, like many other of the best inventions. It's It was right there in all of our faces, and he just made it happen. He was a scrub tech who worked with a busy joint surgeon and got tired of the late Friday night case where you couldn't get the femoral stem out and you were working on it for hours. And he developed a way to get it out fast and easy and clean and simple. And, man, it has been a game changer. That's amazing. What's what's the name of the, of the uh, technology again? It's a Watson extraction system. Watson extraction system. You know, that's, um, it's interesting you mentioned that because um, at least in, from my perspective, like in the world of ortho, there's not enough, there's always discussion about like new implants or anything, but you're the first person that I've heard talk about technology for revisions. Yeah. Why is and, that? Well, you know, with, um, with primary implants, we're all about the robotics, but robotics hasn't come to revisions yet. It's, it's, it's on the precipice. It's there. And many surgeons are doing it without it being on label um, because we know that, that that accuracy is as important, if not more important in revision work than it is in primaries. But the implant companies haven't really gone after that market heavily yet. And so I think where industry goes, where where the money goes is where all the effort goes, all the marketing goes, and all the innovation goes. And in revision in, implants are already expensive enough to make those more expensive by adding a technology or a device. Um, it, it's just not, everybody's trying to cut costs, not to add to the cost of implants and devices. And so I just think there's not a drive from industry to make that happen. Yeah. You know, it's, and it's funny you mentioned that, like, um, I don't know, not to touch on a sore subject, but like, um, you know, it's hard to to talk about this and not like talk about how all of this is being like reimbursed. And then of course, like the massive headache, well, what the hell we should talk about. It. How do you feel about prior authorizations? Ridiculous. It is a, <laughs> it's a hurdle. Man. Can you, it's for the, the reps should know. I, I, I get on the reps about this constantly that like, you should know what this stuff means. But for the, some of the audience, maybe the younger reps who are new to all this, can you explain what is this? fantastically stupid invention of prior authorizations. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll use knee replacement as a great example. Um, so when you, when the surgeon identifies a patient and we make the final decision that surgery is needed, we have to ask permission from your insurance company uh, to have this uh, elective procedure covered. And what they want to know is, 
have you done enough conservative care that um, it's now time to do a knee replacement? And they use an arbitrary, very mobile set of indications for when it is and when it's not. And um, the bar is constantly changing, but they want to know that you've done a combination of weight loss, activity modification, over-the-counter and prescription medications, physical therapy, injections, bracing, and ambulatory aids, right? So I've got to put in my note which one of those we've done, and I almost have to become an investigative reporter because now they want to know how long did you do it for, where did you do it, when did you do it, um, and then they may make us repeat it even if you've done all that stuff. So for a bone patient who's bone on bone, who no matter what is having a knee replacement at the end of all of this, they're, they're going to make me send that patient to physical therapy, and they're going to make me do injections that aren't indicated for that patient, and they're going to make me jump through all these hoops and turn it into a war of attrition. They really want us as surgeons to, to say, hey, that's it. I give up. I'm moving on to the next patient, and I wish the best for, yeah. for this and, patient. And you know, what's, you know what sucks about that? I mean, it's the same to the patient. For me personally, um, and luckily I'm pretty, pretty damn healthy. And I take, I mean, aside from my medical education, I'm pretty well read. And so I, 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 I'm pretty radical about my own like, uh, uh, health. I, I hurt my back. Um, when was it a few, a few months ago? Um, by the way, if you're over the age of 30, one of the exercises you just don't do anymore, just don't do overhead presses, standing mm -hmm. overhead press is a stupid exercise. There's no point in doing it. Just don't do it. All right. So I did that. And because, and I'm at the, I'm 37. So I'm at that weird age where it's like, I'm starting to realize, Hey, I'm not 20 years old anymore. I can't be doing this. Right. Mm -hmm. So anyways, hurt my back. I, uh, talked to uh, my primary care and I was like, you know, I'm going to go and go to physical therapy, but like, I, I need an MRI. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, I agree. But you know, your insurance isn't going to allow that. I'm like, well, what do you, what are they going to allow? They're like, well, we need to get an x-ray first. I'm like, but that's pointless. And they're like, but they want you to get an x-ray first and then get an MRI. I'm like, got it. So we're going to get an x-ray, which is not indicated, makes no sense. But we're going to do that so they can say, okay, now that we know that the x-ray shows nothing, then you can get an MRI. And I ended up not doing it because for me to set up the appointment and go and everything, and it just, it's so dumb. And that's what they want though. They want yeah, they you want, to exactly. just not they, do it. Yeah. Your yeah. behavior is exactly what they, th that, I let that them is win. why these are in place. I let them win. And, you know, and not only that, but they expose you to radiation to look at a the, uh, at a anatomic um, structure that isn't going to show up on an X-ray. They expose you to that radiation, knowing full well that an MRI is the indicated um, you know imaging. Now there there are a lot of times the patients come into my office with bone on bone arthritis. I get a nineteen dollar X-ray and I say you need a knee replacement, and they say, "Don't you think I need an MRI?" Um, and that that's I don't know how many patients come to my office fully worked up who have had an MRI that has no indication. So it works both ways. You know, there are a lot of mm -hmm. times I'm talking patients out of an expensive treatment. You were trying to, yeah. And yeah. I think, I think like what I'm, what I really hope happens. So there's a couple of things I feel like are happening. One is that there are people, I feel like there's more of them like me who a lot of times, like, I mean, I have insurance, but sometimes I'll go out of insurance because I'm just like, I'm not going to deal with insurance. I'm going to pay out of pocket. And I'm hoping that there'll be some new models that come about to fund medicine. That's like number one. The second thing I think is happening. I don't know if you've done this yet. Have you? Well, I, I don't want to put you on the spot. More physicians, because of, because of uh, ChatGPT, which is great, are essentially just using ChatGPT to battle the prior authorization. Because you're on the other end, you're dealing with a doctor and for for uh, context for everybody. When Dr. Jacob talks to a doctor from, let's say, United or any of these health insurance. He's not talking to an orthopedic surgeon. It's usually somebody who's like primary care or cardiac. Surgeon. He has no idea what they're talking about. Yeah, I'll tell I you, I'll go, one step, I'll go one step further. I've never talked to an orthopedic surgeon. I've never That's talked wild. to somebody in my specialty. That is, Ever. yeah, exactly, exactly. But I think it's going to come to a point where doctors are using you know, uh, large language models or LLMs like chat GPT. And then insurance companies are going to say, okay, we're going to just fire these people. We're going to use RLM. So it's going to be at some point be like AI versus AI in terms of who gets authorized. You know, and it's weird because now all these insurance companies have hired these third party companies to do their prior auth, to deny prior auth. And so we have to go through these clearing houses. We, so the patient will often call the insurance company and say, why was my claim denied? And they're, and they're like, we didn't deny your claim. 
patient calls me back very upset and says, you haven't even submitted anything, but you have to go through some sort of a clearinghouse and they don't, they don't even know. And sometimes the insurance companies don't even know which clearinghouses they're using for which procedures. So it's, it's very cumbersome and difficult on purpose. You know, the less you understand, the less likely you are to engage in the process of trying to fight for your own health care. Yeah, we'll we'll depart this topic, but like just yeah. just as a side note for those who are interested, you know, do you know uh, Dr. Glauco McFecken? Yeah, I love that guy. He's I love he, it. Uh, what he said about publications, Ira is like got to oh, be loving it. You know what? Yeah. Um, was that was that a recent one or a while back? Yeah. He's had several over a long period, but we did one on the Journal of Nature where he's basically, you know, kind of. I saw that one. (laughs) Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, where he's he's like, he's like, oh, we're going to publish. We're just going to charge him for this charge. Yeah. So, so I and I actually, so uh, key tip to reps, humor is a great way to connect with human beings. So Mm -hmm. I actually, I was trying to get Ira on the show, like this is all. uh, maybe two years ago now. And when I initially reached out to Ira, he's like, no, thank you. I'm not just like cold, shut me down. And I was like, all right. I'm like, you know what? I gotta, I gotta warm up to this guy. So I <laughs> saw Glauco McFecken's like first piece on like publications and how everybody's just getting yeah. screwed. So I was like, you know what? I'll post this. I think, you know, he'll, he'll enjoy it. What even better thing that happened was Vinod Dasa uh, down in Louisiana commented yeah. on the post and he's like, and he didn't even know I was trying to get a hold of it. It was just purely, I don't think nothing's coincidental. He goes, Ira, you should totally hook up with Omar. It's even go on a show. And then Ira sends me this message after I've been trying to get him on my show. He's just like, just stone cold wall me. He's yeah. like, Hey, like when are we going to finally get connect? I'm like, when do we mean when are we finally connect? So like, since then we've, we become, we become, you know, we become good, yeah. good friends. He has a children's book, by the way. Do you know that? Yeah, I did. I yeah, did. I, I did just found out about book. that. Yeah. Oh, he's yeah. He's uncle. At this point, he's like uncle Ira for me, but um, no, yeah. Glauco McFecken is doing a 30 days of healthcare where he's just doing all these great parodies on things. And he yeah. didn't want to on uh, United on, I'm, I'm like, Hey, you know what? We have a really great idea. We're going to make people pay for their health insurance, but they're going to pay this thing called a deductible to the point that they hit a premium. And then it's going to reset every year. And they're like, Oh, okay. Well, so, but then we're going to give them their health insurance. And he's like, well, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no. I, 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 the the funniest he's he's he is so funny because he is so spot on with either what he says about insurance companies or the uh, you know the publishers or medical specialties. And he's he's the medical specialties it. are good. I don't know about you, but like when I was in medical school, uh, when I was trying to pick a specialty, there was a guy who I can't remember his name gave me really good advice. He's like, Omar, you're wasting your time right now. He's like, you're going to go into the specialty that fits your personality. It has nothing to do with your interests. And lo and behold, all, like a lot of the guys who started off in med school who are like, I'm going to be a surgeon, like two became psychiatrists. The other guys yeah. went to ER. Like it all, it's just so much yep. on personality. You it know? really is. And where you feel comfortable and where you, it's a hard job. And if you, if you aren't really happy with it, you're not going to make it. You know, there's a, there's a neurosurgeon, uh, I used to cover and he, he, I told him a buddy of mine is going to neurosurgery. And the first question he asked, he's like, he's like, oh, he's like, does your buddy like sci-fi or working on cars? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. So Yeah. I, I, um, he did one on ortho and he basically called the EKG, the danger squiggles. And, uh, I think, <laughs> The next day, every anesthesiologist in our hospital asked me uh, some sort of, you know, side comment about looking at the danger squiggles uh, as an you know, orthopedic surgeon. It's you got to say the culture of medicine is so interesting. Like the whole again, the whole system because you're talking about almost like a closed system where people are working long hours in close quarters with each other. And so, I mean, like perfect example: trauma reps. Their entire life is like sleeping, get in the car, and driving to the case. And so like this whole world of like how things are influenced through memes and stuff, it's just like, it's just fascinating. It's a hell of a time to be alive. Even uh, ortho has always been a a subspecialty that has been kind of ragged on quite a bit, but we're, we're also, you know, pretty smart guys and we are smart enough to know that we're smart, but we don't want anybody else to think that we're smart. And so there's actually a more work. That's right. (laughs) That's right. So that's, uh, there's actually a publication where, uh, an anesthesiologist and an orthopedic surgeon were arguing about which subspecialty had higher average board scores. And there was, they, so this orthopedic surgeon went through, collected all this data and published a paper 
on the average board scores of orthopedic surgeons are higher than the average board scores of anesthesiologists. Yeah, that's called, true. Yeah. Strong. It's, I think it's called strong as an ox and twice as dumb or something. The paper is something that like up. that. It's really good. It's a, it, it's done as a somewhat of a, uh, a satire, but it really is a really interesting paper. And I, I just, that kind of sums up ortho in general for me. <laughs> There's, I don't remember Glaucoma McFeckin, but there was some test like in the, or, the, the ortho parody of like, uh, like orthopedic surgeon residency interview and the, 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 the attending asked the questions like, what, like, what is a how blank? Is, what's that? No, how not how much you bench. bench. That was the other one. No, there was one. It was a, it was a, it was some, some kind of test, like, I don't know, blood panel or anything. Like, what do you think about this? And he's like, you mean internal medicines problem? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And uh, you know, I, I'll tell you, it's, it's bad when, when I, one of the things I enjoyed about my, or I'm maybe not enjoyed, but uh, that I respected about the Cleveland Clinic Fellowship was they made you do, you couldn't consult medicine uh, essentially for everything that happened on the floor. You had to do it yourself and you were, you consulted specialists if you needed them, but it was pretty rare. And so you had to really um, pay attention and learn some things and have some knowledge that you wouldn't normally have uh, or have been exposed to as an orthopedic surgeon it was very valuable. For do you think, I mean, on, on orthopedic education today, do you feel like there's something, do you feel like things can, they should be doing things a little bit differently? Like, is there anything about orthopedic education that you, you feel like could be better? Maybe you have a critique on? You know, I, I'm not a fan of work hour restrictions. I, I um, not a fan of work I, hour restrictions. I, I am not, um, and I'll tell you, there's very few surgical specialties where you're responsible for everything from the base of the skull to the tip of the toes. So that is too much to learn in five years. So if you're going to limit those uh, those individuals from learning things that they would potentially have exposure to, now they don't. If you're going to make them responsible for those things when they get out, you've got to either extend the time and training, which nobody no wants resident that. is in favor of. Nobody wants that. Or you have to limit, um, you know, uh, practice afterward to whatever fellowship training that they may have gotten. So I, I as I've watched um, residents go through training, and, and even the residents that we work with are often saying. I don't want to go. I want to see this case. I, I want to get involved. I, I want to participate. You know, they may have done, admitted that patient, done the H and P, prepped them for surgery, got them already on the floor, and then they can't see the best part of that patient's care because they've met their time limit and they have to leave the hospital. Uh, I really feel like there's a problem there. We swung the pendulum all the way in the other direction now, and we've got to find a happy medium where, yes, we respect you know, normal human nature and sleep and eating correctly, but we don't take away the, the, the ability to be completely trained um, and feel comfortable when you're, you're leaving. I would guess that guys coming out today, uh, many, a much higher percentage are doing fellowships and of those fellowships, maybe even more than one, um, just to get comfortable with what they need to know and be able to do when they get out. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because even when I was in medical school, there was a, there was a debate about this. A lot of the, a lot of the debate was that a lot of that the errors occurring weren't due to tiredness or lack of sleep, but because of the handoff, you know, mm -hmm. the one pushback I do have though, if, if, if we were to go back and keep the hours extended, I would say that it almost should be mandatory for residents to get educated and trained on like good sleep hygiene and habits um, there's one, uh, episode, like I, I'm going to do a sleep episode soon. Um, but, uh, if you look up Joe Rogan, uh, Joe Rogan's episode, 11, number 1109. So 1109 with Matthew Walker, um, really eye opening on sleep. And obviously like the amount of medical error that happens due to the lack of sleep. And I think that it, per personally, I think residents can get, depending on who it is, they can get good sleep, but if the sleep hygiene isn't there, if they're not, you know, I don't know. They're doing things at night that they shouldn't be doing, eating things, et cetera. And then you have, you know, you can get a solid seven, eight hours of sleep. But if you have bad sleep hygiene, it's, you know, it's, it's bad sleep. Well, I'll, I'll push back a little bit on your comments in that who monitors that sleep hygiene when that patient's in attending? If you don't learn how to function in that environment and now you're in attending, you're ultimately the end point for responsibility for that patient's care. And you've never had to work 
the way you have that's to very work. Very good point. You, you, then you aren't trained to do it and you don't know how to cope. And that's where people fall apart when they haven't yeah, had the great... opportunity to slowly build the coping mechanism over time. That's a great point. And you know, like, I mean, if there's one lever of health that you could, you could pull hard and have a lot of, it's like great sleep. The only problem, and again, this is a fact on one side, I really believe like residents and doctors, they have to get good sleep on the other side of it. Aside from the point that you just made that, yeah, at some point you're an attending and you got to learn how to cope. The other yeah. side of it is that we have a physician sh sh shortage and that's not going away. Yeah, so not. people are going to be, yeah. So like, that's the you problem know. is that, you know, there's, unless you want to triple the amount of surgeons available to cover call shifts and to do, instead of being on call for days straight, uh, instead of, you know, if you start to pass laws that say, hey, a surgeon can't be on call longer than X amount of time, that we, we just can't do that because it's, we don't have the numbers to be able to do that. And so it's a problem. I I got to, I, I didn't think I'd cover this, but uh, I got, I have to just share, I have to share a great story. Do you know, uh, you know, the, um, from history, Dr. Uh, William Halstead, the, the historian. The, the name. Yeah. 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 All right. I get, this is a wild one. So Will Halstead, uh, I think he practiced, uh, I, oh yeah, not this is why, cause I was, I was, I did my research at Hopkins. So he trained out of Hopkins and he had this whole thing where, he, you know, he would make residents compete with them on how much they can work straight without sleeping, right? And he, he was like very heroic and everything. Well, it come come to find out, um, the reason why he was able to do that is because he had a really bad cocaine addiction. <laughs> I knew that <laughs> and, and because at the time they were like like experimenting with cocaine and stuff, and so like he uh, for anesthesia or something, so he started using it, and then it got so bad. That he had to check, they made him check himself into like a uh, uh, rehab, but in mm -hmm. rehab, they started uh, experimenting with something else and he left rehab with a heroin addiction. <laughs> <laughs> <Gosh>. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> and, and, you know, it just sounds like, it sounds like some, that's exactly like what a cokehead would do, which is like, it's like, come on, you don't need any sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I, it's interesting that, um, uh, you know, there's so many surgeons who either you develop coping mechanisms and you figure this out. Like for me, I, I knew right away I wanted to do adult recon. That's an elective case. I can schedule those cases. Very few of those cases are surgical emergencies. And so I, when I joined my group, I said, hey guys, uh, by the way, I'm not going to take any call. And they were kind of like, what do you, what do you mean? Here in Oklahoma, you often get paid for call. So you know, it's not just, it's something that many guys want to do. Um, I wanted to build a busy practice. If I knew if I had eight or 10 joint replacements on, where am I going to fit, you know, two or three trauma cases on top yeah, you of can't. that? And so I started to build my model around not taking call. And then I elected to um, leave my, um, my income guarantee early. Uh, and I just said, I'll live off whatever I make, which I love by that. the way, still did very, very well. Um, and um, I just kind of didn't take any financial risks and I started to build the practice identically the way I wanted it to be. Um, and I've grown from there. I, I, uh, I have, you know, you asked me earlier, what are the things you would, you know, avoid doing in your practice model? I would say pay for good help um, and treat them well. My PAs are spectacular. All three of my PAs have a minimum of 15 years for peak surgery experience. How'd you and find them? Along. Um, you know, uh, one came with me from the Cleveland Clinic. One um, was here working with a partner of mine, but the, my partner wasn't as busy as he would like to be. And, and the salary was becoming a burden and I needed somebody. And so we started working together and we've hit it off. He's been with me since, you know, essentially day one. And then the third guy that I hired was somebody that my, one of my other PAs had worked with in the past and had had really good experience with. So when we got busy enough to need a third, um, we hired him. And, and so it's all been word of mouth and, um, and looking for a particular set of experience. I don't want to I don't want to have to teach a, a PA how to do knee injections and how to work up an infection. And I wanted the, that knowledge base to be there. And then I molded it the way I wanted it based on how I want my practice to run, but um, it worked out really well. Um, and I don't regret it for a second. Yeah. It's funny how that works, which is like, I don't know. I'm, I'm a big proponent of like finding really good talent and just paying them well. It, that includes vendors. 
you know, you just get better, better out of them. And it just, I mean, it's a simple model. I don't know, even, you know, some of my friends who are entrepreneurs, uh, who set up their own business earlier on, like when I started, you know, for like, for my show, I have a great, um, uh, creative director who does the videos and posting and everything. And originally I was thinking about doing this, like somewhere offshore. And my buddy gave me really good advice. He's like, dude, it's like the amount of money that you're, you think you're saving on the front and you're going to pay paying on the back end, training that other person, the time difference, the language barriers, all these different things. It's so true. Yeah, you know, very much so. And, you know, they, they have direct patient interaction. and Those patients have to build the same level of confidence with the PA that they have with me. Otherwise, I have to be in clinic. And when, every time I'm in clinic, I'm not in the OR. And my true value to that patient is in the operating room. That's where all my training comes into play. That's where my expertise is. And that's where I'm most beneficial. Now, certainly I add some value in the clinic, but um, joint replacement in particular is so repetitive that I can teach a lot of people how to do what I need to be able to do in the clinic. What I really need you to do is spot the things that are outside of the norms and then bring them to my attention. And so I see every new patient and then I see every uh, complication, complaint, concern, or issue from a patient. And that's my primary role in clinic. I think that's where my value is. Otherwise, I'm in the OR five days a week, um, and I do as many cases as I can do um, to add value to what I bring to my patients. Got it. Got it. And kind of like sort of wrapping up, I, I want to do like a little bit of rapid fire with you, and uh, you can take as long as you want on these on these questions. But as soon I'm as ready. You I've been answer, I've been listening to your other podcasts. I, I yeah, you see, you see, you already know it. So we'll start with the first one, which is, um, you know. Uh, continuing education obviously is a very important thing in medicine. Um, is there a book you feel like you gift and recommend more, more often than others? Yeah. The Cleveland clinic way, um, which is a, a book talking about how their administrative model sets them up for success. So, you know, the bulk of their administrative team are clinicians who currently practice in their field or their specialty. So when you make a change, that if affects patient care, it also is going to affect your patient care. And so feeling the the outcome was really important. So we it's a great example. The hospital had switched from one um, suture vendor to a, a different one about halfway through my fellowship. And boy, it was terrible. It was there was a clear difference in quality one to the other. Well, about two and a half weeks in, the CEO at the time was Toby Cosgrove, and he immediately said, never. And I thought, wow, that, that would never happen if your leadership team were, were pure administrators. They wouldn't understand that dollars and cents value change would be too important to them to to turn around and go back. I'm ha yeah, I'm happy you mentioned that because yeah, I know some great administrators who are not clinicians, but they do a great job of listening to clinicians. Mm -hmm. And they're more like stewards of the hospital than like mm -hmm. unfortunately most hospital admin who just walk in and it's just like you work for me. And they just want to sit back behind their office and just like look at the numbers and just make yeah. decisions based on that with their CFO. Sorry, probably lost some listeners yeah. on that one. <laughs> well, you know, what you say is true and that we, we don't give, there are good administrators out there and we don't, you know, I, I need to study those guys closer to, to see really what, what is it about that individual that makes me trust them or want to work hard for them? Um, do you ever watch uh, Doc Vader? Um, is that Z-Dog? Yeah, Z Dog. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Z Dog, yeah. MD. I mean, oh, man, that, that's that's a that's when you really know you you're in this industry. Is you know Z Dog, MD. That's yeah. that's a classic. Yeah. So Doc Vader. When he one. nails it, he nails it with his <laughs> you know comments. And he's hard on administrators, but you know um, there really needs to be some level of understanding about the decisions that you make and how they impact the the clinical care. And and that for me, that book was impactful. Yeah, and I think the thing. Me personally, if you look at the history of medicine, uh, physicians are entrepreneurial. Like even even if you have clinicians who are graduating now who've never been exposed to medicine two three decades ago, it, it somehow it's in the it's in our it's in the blood of medicine. Mm -hmm. And so the more as an administrator you don't understand that, the more you're going to end up with like really disgruntled employees. And clinicians are are crafty, smart people. They're going to find a way. Very much to, so. To, to screw you later. Like, you yeah, know, like, I, I have to yeah. tell you, I honestly, I, I'm very contrarian by nature. And when I get told no, 
it is almost a challenge to me. Okay, no, okay, I'll figure this out. We're doing it. Whether you want me to do it or not, we're doing it some way. And if we don't do it, I'm going to work every day to make you as miserable as I am not getting whatever I want, uh, you know, so. Oh, yeah. You know, I don't know. I need it. You know, I have to um, have him back to talk about, but like, I feel like um, when Ira started Joey, it was a similar thing where like, it was kind of like a hold my beer moment where he was just yeah. like, got because like, just he, you know, he's a true New Yorker. He yeah. does not mess around. And I just feel like there was one day he was like, you know what, what, um, uh, it's from like the big Lebowski where he's like, uh, this, this, op- I will, not, this oppression will not stand. What is that? <laughs> yeah. What's the line? Yeah. Hold on. It's I got it. We got it. Yeah. It's pretty close. Hold on. I got to look this up. Big Lebowski. Yeah. Oh, aggression. Not it. like this, I, this, this aggression will not stand. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. That's exactly I mean, I it. I think it- I think that these these type you know we're, right now we're in a weird spot, especially in orthopedics. With you know uh, everybody's coming in and trying to buy our practices and and yeah. to change the model. And uh, I think we're going to see a group of leaders who stand up and say we're taking back control of our specialty. You know we're not going to allow hospitals to dictate. We're not going to allow um, you know capital to dictate. We're going to make the changes that we want and go back to um, the decisions being made by the surgeon instead of by the cost. A hundred percent. I hope to see that as well. All right. Last one. Um, and this might take you a little bit of time, but uh, it's a good one. Um, you know, mentorship is such an important part of medicine, like, you know, who you train under, et cetera. And obviously, especially as a surgeon, you got, you like, there are some people who mop the floor with you. Mm-hmm. What was the most painful thing it doesn't have to be a mentor, but painful things somebody told you, whether it was in medical school or training or fellowship or in practice, that changed you for the better? One of the scrub techs that I work with, um, who has been with me since my very first day, um, she we, we were going through COVID and everybody was trying to keep staff and and you know, she was talking about her performance evaluation and how she was valued or how she perceived being valued by the hospital, which, you know, I have, I have ownership in. And uh, I was so disappointed in all, my organization's lack of ability to demonstrate to her, her true value or how we perceived her true value. Um, and I, I just don't think we do a good job. I think that's why nursing turnover is so high. Um, we can do all the things like, uh, you know, throw a party on, during nurses week or whatever. And those things mean nothing to the staff. They usually get a junk gift that they would rather have, you know, held, had the hospital hold on to and give them something of value, like a a real bonus. But um, I I was, I I remember that being very impactful to me. It almost brought a tear to my eye. We were scrubbing a case and I could hear that in her voice. It was genuinely, um, you know, I'm working my butt off. You know, the the Oliver Anthony song that's kind of really popular right now, Richmond, North of that's, Richmond. Man, yeah. And she was describing that to me. And I thought, does everybody feel this way? And I, I have to say, I, the majority of people that were honest with me um, expressed that. And I thought, there's got to be a better way for us to say how valuable you are to us without feeling like we're going to get extorted or, you know, held against the wall. It's okay to tell somebody you're really valuable to me and I couldn't do what I do without you. We just, in, in healthcare, we just, we just, we make providers, you know, numbers. We turn them into providers. And, and so that was impactful to me. Something I think about when I leave the OR, if somebody did something really good, I turn around and say, thank you. That was impressive. You did this or you did that. I'm also hard on my team. Um, but I'm the first person to say, I'm sorry. I'm also the first person to say you, you, that was awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think the, the other, the other thing about medicine that I'm excited about is like, you know, like I think is really inspiring that, you know, coming on the show that you told me that not only did you listen to it, but you listened to like the sales episodes and you've probably, you know, improved as a physician because you learned how to like a different approach to selling and stuff. And, you know, learning about different ways of leadership. I think these is, this is how medicine gets better. Um, and I think a lot of medicine, um, I mean, look, uh, who is it? 
to Gowanda, he did like checklist manifesto. Like they've been using checklists all over, you know, for, for eons, but it's just like, how do we look outside of the industry and just do a better job of running it, you mm -hmm. know, um, whether it's within our team or hospitals. Yeah. A hundred percent. So Dr. Jacob, it's been such a pleasure. I had a blast. We're definitely going to have you back on. Um, where that. can people find you? Yeah, you can go to my website, drpauljacob.com. Um, and I, I certainly love doing a, a lot of social media stuff. I am not yet comfortable um, in really do, becoming, trying to become a national uh, figure like a Corey Calendine or somebody like that. I'm really, most of my posts are for my patients, uh, but um, I, I'm getting more and more comfortable with trying to be an advocate for my profession and, and in particular my subspecialty. And, and, um, so that, that probably be the best way now, I'm certainly on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and, and most social media. Fantastic. Yeah. And, and again, not everybody wants like, um, like worldwide fame and everything, but Hey, you know, you can be, you can be famous and like well-respected leader within your community and have a really positive impact, not just on your patients, but Mm -hmm. the community you serve other surgeons and everything. So I'm really happy you're doing that. So mm -hmm. all right, everybody Well, be sure to check out Dr. Jake. I'm going to leave the links in the, in the show notes below, go download his paper on Joey. I'm going to leave that link below. And as always, don't forget, give the show five stars, write a review. We stay number one that way. That being said, I'm your host, Omar Khatib, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you for enjoying another epic episode of the state of medtech. If you're feeling inspired and love this episode, do us a favor, hit that subscribe button and turn notifications on so you never miss an episode. And be sure to give us five stars and write a short review because that helps more people discover this amazing community of ours. If you're a company who has a executive that you'd like to be on the show or perhaps you want to sponsor one of the episodes, shoot us an email at hello at katibandco.com. Take care and we'll see you next time.